Good morning. At the outset, I would like to thank the organizers of this meeting for inviting me and providing such excellent hospitality. Now, the very basic aim of cancer early detection is to reduce the number of deaths from that particular disease. And in some of the cancers, because we know there is a pre-malignant state, we can prevent that cancer and can reduce the incidence from the cancer. So cancer early detection can, number one, reduce the mortality, and number two, can reduce the incidence. And there are, there is adequate evidence from around the world. So for example, this is what happened with breast cancer screening introduction in many of the countries. Say for example, Canada, Australia, when after they introduced organized population-based breast cancer screening, the, the incidence, and, uh, sorry, the mortality from breast cancer came down. Whereas the countries which could not introduce organized population-based cancer screening, the, the mortality went up and up. And I would like to stress again and again on two words, population-based and organized. What is population-based screening? Population-based screening is one in which individual target population is identifiable and they can be systematically invited to participate in screening. An organized screening program is where there is a specific policy, protocol, and a mechanism to enforce that protocol. The early detection approach, there are two different uh, ways we can do it. Number one is screening, which is systematically doing a particular test on the asymptomatic population, apparently who do not have any disease, and try to identify the disease at a preclinical stage, that is before the disease causes cancer, uh, sorry, causes symptoms. On the other hand, the early diagnosis means that there is adequate facilities for the people who have symptoms to go for further diagnosis and appropriate treatment. So screening is much more complex, much more intensive, and requires a good organized health system to implement. But once implemented, it is much more cost effective. On the other hand, early diagnosis, it is possible to implement in any kind of setup, and at least will save some lives. So if we look at this picture, at the total continuum of the disease, the early diagnosis is for people who have already started having the disease, and they have already the symptoms. So we need to do some tests on them to make sure that the disease is detected and treated. That is the most important part. It is not just diagnosis, it is also linking diagnosis with treatment. And it has to be focused only on a small group of people who have already the, the symptoms. Whereas if we look at the screening part of it, screening, it is capable of de detecting the disease not only in the early preclinical stage, but also in precancerous stage. So it can prevent many deaths, but then it needs much more effort, much more resources to implement. So what now I will do is try to understand which cancers should we focus on for cancer screening and early detection going by a certain number of criteria. Uh, the gentleman there was talking about prostate cancer. Why should we screen for colorectal cancer and not for prostate cancer? Why should we screen not for uh, oropharyngeal cancer? So all these things are bound by a set of criteria. Those criteria are valid since 1968. That's the strength of those criteria. So let us look at them one by one. Number one criteria, the disease should be a significant public health problem. 
So let us look at the, uh, the diseases which are significant public health problems in Russian Federation. Here, uh, you can see at the top is lung cancer. Here, uh, I will just say one word. Lung cancer screening is not yet recommended because of two reasons. Number one, yes, it has shown mortality reduction. You know, we can do lung cancer screening with low dose CT scan. Low dose CT scan has shown mortality reduction by 20% in one single study, which was conducted in US. It's called NLST study. But then other studies, they have not shown mortality reduction. So that is why it is not recommended, number one. Second reason is we have much better intervention to tackle lung cancer, which is primary prevention, making, making sure that people don't smoke. So that is why lung cancer screening is not recommended. But all the other three major cancers, colorectal cancers in male and uh, women, breast cancer in women, cervical cancer in women. All three are major burdens and something can be done about them. The second criteria, that the disease we are trying to intervene should have a preclinical disease or a precancerous stage and we should know the natural history of the disease. Without knowing that, it is very, very difficult to do some kind of public health intervention. For, for <coughs> cervical cancer, probably that is one cancer for which the natural history is best known. We know it starts from a virus infection and then it goes through different stages of pre-malignant. So CIN1, maybe most of them will disappear. CIN2, 10%, 15% of them, if not treated, they will go in to develop cervical cancer. CIN3 is a real cervical cancer precursor. If not treated, half of them will develop into cancer. So we know very well that if we can do some tests and detect the disease at any of these stages, we can treat them and prevent cervical cancer. Similarly, for colorectal cancer, we know 95% of the colorectal cancers, they originate from adenomas. And of these adenomas, the particularly the, the, the problems are the advanced adenomas. That means adenomas which are one centimeter or more in diameter, who have high-grade high dysplastic changes, and veloglandular appearance. So this kind of <coughs> advanced adenomas, even they can be treated even endoscopically if they are removed. And subsequently, the chance of developing colorectal cancer is, is substantially reduced. I'll discuss that in my next presentation. Breast cancer. Till now, we do not know any pre-malignant stage. We know they're about atypical hyperplasia and all, but then still that is not really, a, uh, we, we don't know the natural history that well. But one thing we know about breast cancer, even if the disease is detected at stage two with a couple of limb nodes, you treat them properly, the, the success rate of treatment is very, very high. So here what you can see is that even for stage two disease, the the, the, the uh, survival rate is uh, about 90% survival rate. So that is important about breast cancer. You detect the cancer early, you can cure the disease in a high proportion of the cases. And even when <coughs> some of the disease can be at more, a bigger size, but then the treatment is so good now. You can see the, uh, the results of treatment around in 1970s, and now we have good chemotherapy, we have good radiation, we understand that uh, the, 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 the role of tamoxifen, and we, ha we have achieved a significant improvement in breast cancer survival after treatment. So that is why the, the screening for cervical cancer, colorectal cancer, and breast cancer is so very rewarding. Something is a problem. Right. <clears throat> then 
there has to be a suitable screening test. Now let us see for which, for which, which, which are the suitable screening tests. No questions asked. For breast cancer screening, mammography is the only screening test which has shown to reduce mortality from the disease. And I'll discuss that more in more details later on. For cervical cancer screening, there has been quite a lot of change over time. At one time, pap smear cytology was the only screening test. But then, when we evaluated pap smear cytology, now you can see, we understand that pap smear cytology has very moderate sensitivity, around 50% sensitivity, to detect even high-grade disease. It worked in many countries because women were screened every two years or even yearly. And cervical cancer has a very slow natural history. So the disease that was missed in one round of screening was picked up in the next round. So it worked. But then we need a better sensitive test. And that is why we have the new test, which is the high-risk human papilloma virus detection, which has very consistently showed in many studies that the sensitivity is much better than cytology. It is around 90% sensitivity. The so specificity is not yet appropriate, but then that is one test which has a lot of advantages. For colorectal cancer screening, now we have a range of tests. You can see in European Union countries themselves, there are countries which are doing the fecal occult blood test, which is probably the, the most doable test at the present moment, cheapest, but then it has to be repeated every two years. But then some of the countries like Italy, they are moving towards flexible sigmoidoscopy, which has to be done once in five years. And some of the countries like Germany, Poland, Czechoslovakia, they have introduced colonoscopy, total colonoscopy, which has to be done every 10 years. So maybe the initial infrastructural need is more, but then because the less number of people will require the test, maybe the, the, it will be more cost effective. But then well, I'll discuss this later. But so the point is that we have good tests to detect cervical cancer, to detect breast cancer, and to detect colorectal cancer at the early stage. And the, but then finally, we'll have to show that this intervention of screening has reduced mortality from the cancer. Because that is where I, start, where I started. I said that screening should show reduction in mortality. And until and unless we have that, we should not introduce that as a pro, in a program. And colorectal cancer screening, you can see uh, if, if you can treat these adenomas, advanced adenomas endoscopically, you can prevent the disease and can achieve mortality reduction. So here, <coughs> there are different studies. These are all studies which have looked into flexible sigmoidoscopy to reduce the incidence of colorectal cancer. And as you can see, almost all of these studies, they have shown that colorectal cancer <coughs> incidence can be reduced by 20% by a single round of sigmoidoscopy or one sigmoidoscopy every five years. And similarly, all these trials, they have shown significant reduction in mortality. Only after this evidence came out, the European screening guidelines recommended flexible colonoscopy, and now it has been introduced in some of the programs. And for the policymakers, they will always ask about the resources. Do we have enough resources to have this new intervention? So that is why you will also have to demonstrate that these interventions are cost effective. So cost effectiveness is a very complex thing. But then all the interventions, cervical cancer prevention by screening, it is one of the most cost effective intervention in the world, it's almost as good as vaccination for prevention of, of, of infection. But now we have enough evidence that breast cancer screening with mammography, colorectal cancer screening with either fecal occult tests, blood tests, or by sigmoidos uh, uh, colonoscopy is cost effective. So based on these evidences, the different countries, they have introduced the programs. But then, there's a very interesting 
I, I'm sorry about the, this thing, the quality of the, the picture may not be good. But then essentially it is showing that many of the Latin American countries for years, they have practiced cytology based screening. And as you can see, there are many countries like Brazil, Chile, they have achieved quite a high coverage. But still, there was no reduction in cervical cancer incidence and mortality. Why was that? As I said, it is not or screening is not only about only detection of the tests. It is not only about doing so many thousands of tests. It is about ensuring that those who are screen positive, they have access to further diagnosis like colposcopy, colonoscopy, and treatment. So unless there is a linkage between screening and treatment, it will not work. And that is exactly what happened in these Latin American countries. So what was lacking was organization of the program to make sure that those who are positive are recalled for treatment. And that is why, you know, this, this is, these are the criteria for organized screening program. And once you can have that, your program will, 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 will deliver results. Say so this is showing in, in UK, for years also they practiced cytology based screening, but there was no reduction in cervical cancer incidence or mortality. But in 1990s, they brought in the system of organization. They brought in the system of recalling the positives and then it started going down. So the important lesson here is that we should not only think of doing the test, we should make sure that we do the test properly because of this. The screening not only does good to some people, it will also do harm to some people. And here we come to the question of prostate cancer screening. Prostate cancer screening has a significant number of over diagnosis. That means if screening was not, not done, those men who were, would, would not ever had the diagnosis of prostate cancer in their life. They would have had a normal life. They would have died from it, from some other reason uh, other than prostate cancer. So that is over diagnosis. And in, because of over diagnosis of prostate cancer, the treatment is, uh, you know, the uh, radical prostatectomy. It has got a lot of complications. The men, they become incontinent. <coughs> they lose their sexual life. They have many other problems. So over diagnosis of prostate cancer, it, it, and because of that, prostate cancer screening is not recommended. There has been a trial which has shown some mortality reduction, but then it is always a balance between benefit and harm. Here, the harm of prostate cancer screening using PSA is much more, and that is why prostate cancer screening is not recommended. The international agency does not recommend prostate cancer screening. Similarly, for ovarian, uh, sorry, for breast cancer, there is a bit of overdiagnosis. Here you can see what happens after introduction of screening. After introduction of screening, the incidence of early breast cancers go up. But normally you expect as the early cancers are more diagnosed, the more advanced metastatic cancers, they will come down. But that has not happened. That has remained static. So that means there is some amount of overdiagnosis. Now we accept that 15 to 20 percent of the breast cancers diagnosed in a screening program are overdiagnosis. But then there the harm is not that bad. The benefit is much more to those 80 percent of the women who get the benefit of screening. So that is why breast cancer screening is there. Prostate cancer screening is not there. Based on this principle, that those interventions which cause less harm, more cost effective, should be introduced, and not those who cause more harms. Thank you very much. So, uh, to take the questions, I will take my, uh, uh, you know, microphone. I think I will sort of chair this session, and I think we have time for only one question now. He, who raised the hand first? Can you tell uh, for us some about lung screening? Okay. <clears throat> Is it possible or not? Okay. 
So uh, let me uh, tell you the, the, there have been two major trials for lung cancer screening. One is NLST trial, which was essentially done in multicentric trial in USA. Another is the PLC, uh, sorry, uh, uh, another has been the European trial. Now, of these, only the NLST trial has shown that those who are at high, very high risk of having lung cancer, that is people who have 30 pack years of cigarettes smoking history, they should be screened. So they were screened with low dose CT, which has got very little radiation exposure. It takes uh, about, uh, you know, it does not require the dye. It requires uh, about 10 seconds of breath holding and you can do the CT. It takes so less, less time. So they did LDCT for these men who use uh, 30 pack years of uh, cigarettes every year. And they found that after four rounds of screening, there was reduction in mortality by 20%. Okay. Now, that is very good. That is acceptable. But then we need to look into this more closely. This was done in centers in USA, which were like the topmost centers to have radiology services. So the topmost people who are involved in that radiology, uh, in the, those assessment of the CT scan results. Number two, they had a very complex algorithm. It was not that whoever was uh, diagnosed to have any abnormality on CT scan should go for an, an FNSC of the lung or core biopsy of the lung. So they had made a very complex algorithm. And then only those who were positive on those algorithms, they went for FNSC. Now there is a concern. Is it feasible to replicate that even in cent different centers in USA? Is it possible to replicate that in primary healthcare settings? You know, screening is something which should be at the primary or middle level healthcare setting. It cannot go be done in tertiary care centers as a routine. So the replicability of that is a problem. And then we cannot just depend on one single trial results. So that is why the, the till now the recommendation is LDCT is, should not be used for screening for lung cancer, rather lung cancer should not be screened for. On the other hand, the more focus, more resources should be met to be put in for tobacco control, making sure people don't take to uh, smoking or they quit smoking. That will be much more cost effective. Yes, please. Uh, well, okay. Yes, can I, can I, can I, can I a short question. Can, can I challenge this opinion a little bit? Because uh, um, uh, first of all, we, we can say that lung cancer screening is not recommended because we have USPSDF statement. And uh, second thing, yes, it's one trial, but it's high quality trial. So the other thing is we not only have a reduction in lung cancer mortality, but also overall reduction which is very rare for screening trials, but we see that in the lung cancer screening trial. And I think that's, is it more a problem of implementation, uh, not the we effectiveness of lung cancer screening? Yes, there's a problem with overdiagnosis. Yes, there's a problem with so many nodules, but still it, uh, sh at least we should try to implement it and not just uh -huh. Th uh, thanks, uh, no. thanks, Anton, for these points. First thing is, I'll take your last point first. Because screening is a public health intervention. We should not forget something we cannot implement, we should not be recommending. Say, for example, colonoscopy screening, if you look at it, it has got a lot of even cost effectiveness of colonoscopy screening has been established. But then if you look at what's happening in real programs, you offer fit. You offer colonoscopy, people are mostly going for fit because they think that, that it, it is much more invasive. So in public health, one has to be pragmatic. One has to look at the setting. You cannot just see, say, okay, that trial showed results and I'm going to implement that because trials are in a very controlled setting. 
everything is under you know the best people are doing it in the best possible way with best infrastructure so one has to look into the implementability us fda the the recommendation that's the only body even in us to recommend lung cancer screening and you see the recommendation there are quite a few vagueness you know they are not very they're saying is clear about you know the, how, how frequently how long they should uh, continue with the screen, screening what happens if there are uh, you know those algorithms are somebody who is in the middle of that those algorithms not clearly positive not clearly negative what there should be this thing so it's it's still quite unclear this thing but then yes i mean uh, and then we always very strongly feel and support that the resources we are planning to put for uh, for LDCT can be better utilized for primary primary prevention. I'm sorry, I know that you don't have time, but this is a very important question. We have to discuss it. I mean, I think that this. I'm sorry, but I need to, I need to make a comment. Yeah. Well, in fact, this is not a question. In fact, we know that the results of randomized trials. I mean, the reduction in this case for 20 percent is never, never, ever reproduced in real life. We know this from breast cancer screening, from other screenings. And in the field, in real life, reduction, mortality reduction is always less, less by half or even, even less. So uh, even this is a sort of uh, restriction for going to the field and to implement it this in the screening programs in big countries. This is one uh, comment. Another comment is that in this American study, I know it very well, I know the people who have done this study, they, there was a huge, older studies as well, huge rate of false positive, false positive. Yeah. 25% incredible, incredible high positive. rate of false positive. What to do with this false positive CA in, yes. in the field, I mean, where you and me and some of people in the audience know that. I mean, nobody else knows, I mean, in, in the country, there where this clinic should be implemented. Well, I'm sorry that I added this comment, but I have a question. I know the answer, but I, I would like to hear it from you for the audience. Paruski uh, was right. I'm sorry. Uh, no, is detection rate means something as a, a measure of effectiveness of screening? Detection rate. Yeah. yeah. I tell you why because in this country we are hearing ever that detection rate has increased, and this is a, a major. Um, comments of the suggesting that the screening is uh, effective. Я сказал о том, что является ли выявляемость, рост выявляемости, вы слышали, все вы слышали все время о диспансеризации, что растет выявляемость. Я хочу услышать от коллеги, является ли рост выявляемости измерением эффективности скрининга. Thank you. I'm sorry, chair. So, first thing is, thank you very much for supporting my contention about the lung cancer screening. Exactly, that is what our uh, kind of worry is, that something which has been done in a, in a randomized setting, whether it is, can be replicable in a real life setting, especially when in that trial, 24% of the people were positive on this thing, but then subsequently only 1% had uh, uh, an, an FNSE. So there's a huge amount of false positives, so that's true. Second thing is, detection rate you know how do we say which this test is good or bad we generally talk of sensitivity specificity and all those things but in a real life program you cannot estimate sensitivity specificity. so there is a surrogate for sensitivity which is the detection rate so if you detect more theoretically that means that particular test is better than a test which is detecting less. I'll show you in colorectal cancer screening this thing, if I get we are time. Uh, but then, as I, I used to very rightly say, only detection rate does not mean that the program is working. That can be detection rate can be because of false positivity of the test and low specificity of the test. So that is why monitoring of the program, 
and the evaluation of that monitoring result very critically. Next, what I'll do is in my next program, I have a real program monitoring data. You can see how things vary and how the countries should look at those data very carefully. But yes, agreed. Detection rate is not all. Detection rate can be because of false positives and can be artificially high. Thank you.